from uh, about 50 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hey, murder fam, and welcome back to Serial Killing, a podcast. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and this is Serial Saturday where every Saturday we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on John and Sarah Macon. John and Sarah Macon were both born in 1845, so let's get into some history for that time. This year, Edgar Allan Poe's work, The Raven, was first published in the New York Evening Mirror. Florida was admitted as the 27th U.S. state. An earthquake destroyed part of Mexico City and some other cities along its fault line. A suspension bridge in Great Yarmouth, England, collapsed and killed around 80 people most of which were children. Frederick Douglass's autobiographical narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, was published by the Boston Anti-Slavery Society. The Aberdeen Act was passed by the Parliament of the United Kingdom, empowering the British Royal Navy to search Brazilian ships as part of the abolition of the slave trade from Africa. Manifest Destiny. So U.S. President James K. Polk announced to Congress that the Monroe Doctrine should be strictly enforced and that the United States should aggressively expand into the West. Some other notable people born in 1845 were Emperor Alexander III of Russia and Edmund James de Rothschild. So John's parents were William Samuel Macon and Ellen Bolton. I was lucky enough to find a website, familymacon.blogspot.com, that had background information on their families. So William, John's father, was born into uh, kind of an inner area of London, England, in August of 1802. He was the fourth child of his parents. When William was 18 years old, he was arrested for assaulting another young man and stealing his silver watch and apparently two keys that were worth some value. He was, of course, found guilty and sentenced to be hanged, but the sentence was repealed and he was sent to the colony of New South Wales in 1822, arriving aboard the Mary II. Once he arrived, he was assigned to the Carpenter's Gang at Pennant Hill's Timber Getting Establishment, where he learned his trade and became rather skilled at it. He was a sawyer by trade, working in the logging industry. John's mother, Ellen, was born in 1816 in Birmingham, England. Life was becoming more difficult for the farming community with the invention of these new kinds of machines that unfortunately replaced people. These people were forced to move into the cities to try to find work. Then the cities would become crowded and people couldn't find jobs and so they would resort to stealing. Ellen's mother was one of those people convicted of receiving stolen goods and she, along with her children, were transported to Australia. Sarah's father had been sent long before that. So here's an excerpt from an older child's journal 
that talks about that actual journey by boat. Quote, As for the 96 women and children below decks, conditions were unbearable. In heavy seas, hatches were always battened down and every scuttle closed. No fresh air reached them at all. No ventilation of any kind. The stench was appalling. Nor was it possible for them to leave their close set tiers of bunks. Each time a big sea crashed on the deck above, several tons of water flooded down, drenching bedsheets, mattresses, clothes, sometimes even washing sleepers from their bunks if they were able to sleep." Unquote. But after three months at sea, they finally reached Sydney, and it was recorded that all of the convicts survived the trip. However, Sarah and her younger sister were placed in an orphanage. Luckily, one of her older sisters, having gotten married, tried to get both her younger sisters out of the orphanage, but could only get one, and it was not Sarah. Once her mother had completed her sentence, she was able to get Sarah back. Sarah's father had, by this time, died in Tasmania. Now, it isn't clear how they met, but William and Ellen got married in 1837. Ellen was 20 years old and William was 24. Not long after their marriage, the couple moved to Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. They bought the old steam packet hotel and turned it into a family home. They had their first child only one year into their marriage and went on to have 11 children in total. John was the fourth child and the third son. They were described as well-known and respected members of their community. They went on to own several hotels, though none of them exist now. So let's get to Sarah's parents. Her father was Emmanuel Sutcliffe and her mother was Ellen Murphy. Emmanuel was born in 1813 and living in Leeds when he was convicted of some crime, though I couldn't find what, and was put on a ship to Tasmania in September 1833 when he was just 20 years old. He was on that ship with 190 other convicts. The ship landed four months later. From there, he worked at a lumber mill. Ellen was born in 1816 in Limerick, Ireland. At some point, her family moved from Ireland to Liverpool, England, as the census shows her residence as being there when she was 10 years old. So in 1826, when she was 10, she had seven other siblings, her being near the middle. That's about all I could find out about Sarah's mother. I don't know what brought her to Australia or when she arrived, but at some point, Ellen met Emmanuel and together they married and had two children, James and then the Sarah of our story. I couldn't really find much about Sarah's childhood at all. We do know that in 1865, at 20 years old, she married a man by the name of Charles Edwards, who was a mariner, you know, working on ships for what we can assume the fishing trade. Together they had a daughter. Now I don't know if they divorced or if Charles passed away, but for whatever reason he was out of the picture. And another mystery is how John Macon and Sarah Sutcliffe met, but it was described in a deputation to the colonial secretary reported in the Sydney Morning Herald that John was, quote, a foolish young man who married a woman possessed with an almost fiendish disposition, unquote. Regardless, John and Sarah were married in 1871, both being 25 years old at the time. And remember, she brought a small daughter with her into this marriage. 
It must not have been the marriage that John's mother had hoped for, because remember, they had some money, they owned hotels, remember, because in her will, she didn't leave even close to the inheritance that she left her other children. But the newlyweds, John and Sarah, quickly began having children together. I think they had a total of five sons and five daughters. John worked as a drayman, which means he pulled this kind of low flatbed wagon that was used to transport goods and he worked at a brewery. While working, he suffered some sort of accident which left him unable to work. I don't know what the accident was, I couldn't find it. But regardless, out of money. Also around this time, John's mother died and we already know she left them the equivalent of about $200 per month in inheritance. No lump sum and not even a fraction of what she left to her other children. So this left Sarah and John, along with their children, with very little money to live on. Not even close enough to survive. And they weren't alone in their poverty. There were many, many poor people. And there just happened to be a market for unwed mothers or just people in general who could not care for or did not want to care for their infants. So there were a considerable amount of people who began what is referred to as baby farming. The Australian government also saw the need and the Wendier Royal Commission into Public Charities in Sydney recommended the closure of large-scale institutions in favor of introducing the quote boarding out system which was a forerunner to the modern day kind of foster care system. Families could take in the unwanted children or children that couldn't be cared for and these families would receive a sum of money from the government to help with the added costs of taking in these children. In return, the families were expected to provide the children with, quote, the moral and educational advantages of a normal family life, unquote. And while there are hiccups in any new program, this led to the successful boarding of several hundred to thousands of children. It was this optimistic option that helped an 18-year-old young woman by the name of Amber Murray make the decision to place an ad in the local newspaper in 1892. She was poor. She was a single mother of a baby son who was only a few months old that she had named Horace. She had gotten pregnant out of wedlock and simply could not afford to take care of him in the manner she so desperately wanted to, not to mention the stigma that had been placed on her. She loved her infant son, make no mistake. In her ad, she offered to even pay a small child support payment for his expenses. John and Sarah Macon saw her ad and decided to respond, only they used false names and gave Amber a sob story about how they had just lost an infant son themselves and they would love to take little Horace and give him the home, the love, and the sense of family that they had been ready to give their own baby. Amber felt terrible for Sarah and agreed to pay 10 shillings a week to the Macons to care for her baby. One of their oldest daughters, Blanche, went to Amber's residence, took a three shilling advance as well as the infant with her back to their house. Now each week, Amber did pay the money she had agreed to and John certainly didn't shy away from collecting it. But while she was giving him the money, she would ask to see Horace, you know, hey, how is my baby? When can I see him? John always seemed to have some excuse as to why she wasn't able to see her son that day or very soon at all. It was also around this time that John and Sarah just packed up and moved to a completely different area of Sydney. So 
At some point, Amber decided to go to the address that they had provided her when Blanche arrived to pick up the baby, right? But to her surprise, the family no longer lived there and Amber had no way of finding them. She didn't even know their real name. She would never see her baby again and she wouldn't be the only one far from it. In fact, the Macons took in several babies for the money the government subsidized, as well as extra payments from the parents. Then after a while, they would move, sometimes still owing the rent. John would commonly answer the advertisements. He would negotiate a weekly payment, then signed, quote, papers, that would exonerate the putative father from any future responsibility. And yet, they didn't seem to have really any toddlers or infants with them when they moved to a new area. So, in October 1892, a man had been hired to clear a clogged underground drain in the backyard of a house the Macons had once lived in. Within the drain, the man found some wadded up, foul-smelling clothing. He was confused, kind of taken aback, and he could feel, kind of, that there was something wrapped in this fabric. So he opened it up, and within, he found the remains of two small infants. Horrified, he immediately contacted the police. The police traced who had previously lived in the home and interviewed former occupants and that's when they met the Macons, who were living in a completely different suburb of Sydney. Now the couple admitted that, you know, yes, they had indeed taken on one infant while they lived there, but that they had given the baby back to its parents. The authorities arrested them, as well as four of their own daughters, on suspicion and decided to retrace any properties that the family had lived at. They soon realized they had a huge job on their hands because there were literally so many properties to search. But nonetheless, they meticulously investigated each one. Police exhumed human remains from 11 different homes that the Macons had lived in in the past two years. When it was all said and done, the remains of 12 infants were uncovered in total. This information was given to the prosecutors of this case who argued that the Macons were profiting from taking in infants for child care payments and simply, you know, found it easier to kill the babies rather than actually take care of them. And yet they would continue to deceive the parents so that the parents would continue to pay them. In March of 1893, John and Sarah's own daughters testified against their parents. Their 16-year-old daughter stated that she did recognize some baby clothes that had been recovered from one of the deceased infants that had previously been in the custody of her mother. Their 11-year-old daughter testified that little Horace had come to live at their house, but when they moved to the next one, he had not come with them. A couple came to court and testified that they had been paying John and Sarah 10 shillings a week and that after a few weeks, they had made the couple pay an additional two pounds to cover the costs of a funeral because their baby had died. After all of the testimony, it was time for sentencing. And I actually have the statement from the judge. The judge said, quote, you took money from the mother of this child. You beguiled her with promises which you never meant to perform and which you never did perform having determined the death of the child. You deceived her as to your address and you endeavored to make it utterly fruitless that any search should be made and finally, in order to make detection impossible, as you thought, 
Having bereft it of life, you buried this child in your yard as you would the carcass of a dog. No one who has heard the case but must believe that you were engaged in baby farming in its worst aspect. Three yards of houses in which you lived testify with that ghastly evidence of these bodies that you were carrying on this nefarious, this hellish business of destroying the lives of these infants for the sake of gain." Unquote. Both John and Sarah were given the death penalty and they were to be hung, but the jury recommended that Sarah be spared. After two failed appeals, John was hung in August of 1893. Sarah was served a life sentence in prison with hard labor at the State Reformatory for Women. Now curiously, her daughters petitioned not once but twice and campaigned really for her release. So she was actually paroled after 19 years in 1911. She was at this point 66 years old. Then in 1918, Sarah Macon died in Merrickville, New South Wales. This case threw in the face the awful truth about baby farming, thus leading the New South Wales Legislative Assembly to put together the Children's Protection Act of 1892, bringing, quote, orphaned and destitute children, unquote, under state control. And if you've been with me long enough, you know that this idea of baby farming and people murdering infants rather than actually taking care of them wasn't just in Australia. We have Amelia Dyer and Margaret Waters in England and Minnie Dean in New Zealand as well. And there were others. It is one thing to kill an adult who might stand even the slightest chance at fighting back and saving their own life. But to do harm to any child is unspeakable and unforgivable. They didn't know for sure how the Makins had murdered each child, but the consensus is that they smothered or suffocated each of them. It is my opinion and mine alone that Sarah should have met the same fate as her husband. But what do you think? Leave me a message on Instagram at serial underscore killing or a comment on the YouTube channel. Um, you can visit my website serialkilling.squarespace.com. I am still working on transcripts. Plus, we've got a whole October thing that I've planned and I'm trying to get finished. And mostly, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate each and every one of you because you could be listening to anyone else and you chose me, which still blows my mind. And I'm very, very appreciative. Thanks, guys. I love you all. Have a great day.